Hello and welcome to Showcase, coming to you from our studios in Istanbul. Today, we'll be taking you to the Arab capital of culture for the Sharjah Biennial Art Show and speaking to an artist whose work appeals to all the senses. Plus, a grave new world. Meet the Turkish artist paying tribute to the dead in an eerie underground exhibition. But first... I have to show the world I am the best. Whatever you do, don't leave me. If you leave me, I am finished. Actor Ray Fiennes steps behind the camera once again to tell the story of one of the most influential ballet dancers of all time. Everything's upside down. The world is turned upside down. And that's confounding. Turning art on its head as two of the great masters of illusion come together under one roof in London. As a visionary architect celebrated in the 19th century for his unusual take on neoclassicism, Sir John Sloan was well known for his mastery of light. Famous for iconic British institutions like the Bank of England, his own country home, Pittshanger Manor, has reopened after three years of restoration. Alongside the restored manor sits a gallery, which is marking the occasion with a solo exhibition by sculptor Anish Kapoor. Showcase's Miranda Atty went there to explore the space and examine the similarities between the two creative minds. Pitsanger Manor was built between 1800 and 1804 in Ealing, London. Now, after a $16 million restoration, the manor once again reflects John Soane's unique designs. His distinctive use of arches is on full show alongside his love of light and mirrors. Much of the wallpaper he chose has been restored and there are plenty of hidden corners to explore. Born in 1753, the son of a bricklayer, Soane rose to the top of his profession and earned a knighthood in 1831. Here is a house that he designed, built and lived in himself. And Pitt's Hanger, we feel he created very much as a portfolio to show off to his clients what he could do for them. And so the lovely thing as you go around Pitt's Hanger is you see so many different elements of what makes so exciting and different. Um, his play with light and how he li uses light throughout the house, how he links with the park beyond and very much brings the park into the house. All of these things are things he, he does within Pitt's Hanger in very different ways and in different rooms. As well as a showcase of architectural design, Soane intended for the manor to be a place of entertainment. John Soane's distinctive style is on full show in the manor, which is full of light and hidden nooks and crannies. There's a certain kind of symmetry, therefore, in having Anish Kapoor, who's a master of optical illusion, as the first exhibition since Pitsanger reopened. Well, I didn't make this work uh, thinking about John Soane. Um, I've always, I mean, for many years now, I've made works which are mirrored. Um, but I do recognize that John Soane played visual games. I didn't intentionally set out to, to but I realized that there's a conversation. Um, and I, I think it's, I, I like that conversation. Both artists are obsessed with the use of light. The amber shade in Kapoor's work reflects perfectly Soane's amber light in the manor. But while Soane also used mirrors, it is Kapoor's work that really unbalances you. I mean, I've made works with, with mirrored surfaces, but they're always concave. So concavity has a strange space. The space, because it's concave, it has a focus that's there somewhere. And what that does to you is that beyond the focus, of course, everything's upside down. The world is turned upside down. And that's confounding. And the space is vertiginous. It makes you feel as if you're about to fall into it. And I'm rather interested in that as a, as a real bodily sensation. 
Both artists were incredibly influential in their generations, masters of illusion. Both are consumed with light and shape and mirrors. They may have been working more than two centuries apart, but as this exhibition shows, there are more similarities than differences. Miranda Atty, TRT World, London. Born to a Tatar Muslim family on a trans-Siberian train, he eventually became the world's first male ballet superstar. Rudolf Nureyev's story is a riveting one, and now it's being told in a new film directed by Rafe Fiennes. It chronicles Nureyev's personal struggles during his student years in Leningrad and looks at how he danced his way from a repressive regime into international fame. Take a look at The White Crow. He's been called the Lord of the Dance and even the Brando of Ballet. The story of Soviet ballet dancer Rudolf Nureyev is set to hit the big screen in The White Crow. The film mainly tells of how Nureyev's life-changing visit to Paris provoked his defection to the West in 1961. If I had danced, you would remember. But it was a challenge for director Ray Fiennes, who admitted the filming was scary because he didn't know that much about ballet. I don't come from any ballet background. I had to get to learn about ballet class, ballet rehearsals. I took some ballet lessons myself just so I could have a sense of what's, what it is, just even a little tiny foothold into what's being asked of the body. And for Fines, having Oleg Ivanko, a real-life ballet dancer, playing Nureyev was another thing that enhanced the film. It was his choice to work with a dancer who could learn to act, rather than the other way around. The casting director saw every young dancer in Russia, in every, you know, throughout, throughout the old Soviet Union. And uh, that, that paid off. And Oleg was just preeminently, he looked like him, he could dance, and he turned out to be a fabulous actor. Because it's the first time I play in a movie and uh, I feel needed, um, this, I feel this hard, I to concentrate and every day and uh, 12 hours. Ivanko bears a striking resemblance to Nureyev, but meeting the real Nureyev was quite an experience, according to screenwriter David Hare. Needless to say, like everyone, I was absolutely terrified of him. <laughs> I mean, I've never known anyone in who had such an effect in a room. And, you know, everybody would just run around saying, is Rudy all right? Is Rudy hot? Is Rudy cold? If you leave me, I'm finished. A white crow is a Russian expression for an outsider, an extraordinary person who doesn't quite fit in. It's probably the perfect description for a man who ran away from the repressive regime in his country and ended up transforming the world of ballet forever. Coming up later on Showcase, changing people's perceptions of the modern art world. Breaking ground with new ideas and new commissions, the Sharjah Biennial is back for its 14th year. Performing to evoke a myriad of sensations, we'll speak with Isabel Lewis, one of the artists showing at this year's Sharjah Biennial. The art of dying. We'll take a visit to the perfunctory purgatory in this centuries-old underground system. Dubbed the Arab capital of culture, Sharjah in the United Arab Emirates is playing host to another major art biennial. This convening of local and international artists, curators and scholars is once again focusing on the most pressing issues facing those involved in all aspects of the contemporary art world. Themed Leaving the Echo Chamber, this year's Sharjah Biennial is exploring the possibilities and purpose of producing art while tackling social issues ranging from migration and the global diaspora to modern concepts of time and interpreted histories. This year's curators are not only hoping to create a diverse environment in which artists can thrive, but they also want to confront some of the complexities of a rapidly changing world. 
open to the public from the 7th of March until the 10th of June, this show is bound to raise some eyebrows. Judith Greer is the Director of International Programs at the Sharjah Art Foundation, and she joins me now. Judith, thank you very much for joining us on the show today. Judith, what's been the effect of the biennial so far? Do you think that it can leave the echo chamber and stretch beyond the art world? Well, that's something we'll all have to think about. Um, you know, the biennial just opened on the 7th of March, and one of the things that happens during a biennial and one of the reasons why biennials are special is that they are arenas for experimentation. So, so, for example, the three curators this year have tried to experiment with this idea and trying different forms and different ways of, of discussing the issues. So over the course of the three months, we'll see whether new ideas emerge. So far, there's been lots of very interesting discussion here in Sharjah. I'm sure we'll see more discussions around the world where other art people congregate, and then discussions locally about what it means to actually experience art. Now, Sharjah is one of the sort of smaller, lesser known emirates compared to maybe Dubai or Abu Dhabi, but the art scene is really lively there. How do you feel like the biennial um, sort of brings alive Sharjah's culture? Well, the biennial ha has taken place for the past 14 editions, so it's 28 years now. And it originally came out of a general interest in what is known as the cultured emirate of Sharjah. So Sharjah has been widely recognized as being the emirate that really, where contemporary culture was really fostered and, and began. Um, so the biennial, which started in 1993, was originally very much a, a more cultural diplomatic type of venture where there were pavilions for each country. But from 2003, when Sheikh Ahura al Qasemi took over as curator, it became more of a uh, curatorial model, looking at different themes, trying to explore issues that were important um, in our day and age. So for, for Sharjah and for the UAE, it really offers this incredible uh, opportunity to see art from around the world, to see art that has been largely commissioned here in Sharjah, which is one of the very unique factors of, of this biennial. But of course, the whole of the UAE is quite up and coming in the art world. Can you talk me through some of the highlights for you? We're still on until June, but this year has also seen um, in Sharjah events around the new Africa Institute and the new Sharjah Architecture Triennale will be opening this autumn. So there's a lot of, of different activities that take place. I'm someone who's particularly interested in the nonprofit world. So rather than looking at commercial events, I really enjoy personally the wide range of nonprofit uh, cultural activities that take place here in Sharjah. Judith Greer from the Sharjah Art Foundation, thank you very much for joining us today on Showcase. We turn now to one of the artists featuring at this year's biennial, Isabel Lewis. She's a Berlin-based artist and dancer who's bringing new dimensions to 21st century choreography. The Dominican-American artist is hoping to challenge sensibilities and engage all your senses in her work untitled, inwardness, juice, natures. In her commission, Isabel Lewis brings to life an abandoned seaside factory in a desert away from Sharjah's city center. She shows striking tapestries that move like crashing waves, which are painted with ambient sound recordings. The energy of Lewis's piece builds up. Viewers are first served fragrant cardamom coffee. This is followed by a series of performances from the offerings of an improvisational flutist to a car spiraling around the dancers. Isabel Lewis is an artist and choreographer showing at this year's Sharjah Biennial. Isabel, thank you very much for joining me today on Showcase. Um, in your work, you talk a lot about a 21st century ritual. What does that mean? I think in the world that we're living today, uh, this kind of contemporary world where we've lost a lot of our connection to tradition, um, we have a lack of a uh, way of connecting to one another, and I think ritual is one of the ways to do so. And I think rituals of the past often relied upon the sameness or the homogenous nature of a community. And I think that there's a necessity to try to find new rituals that also 
um, not only just tolerate difference, but actually accept difference as something necessary for the flourishing of any community and to create rituals that can include uh, the individualized nature of the way that we live today. And a lot of your work tends to focus on the audience experience and evoke a kind of sensory response. Can you tell me a bit about that? Yes, I think um, after many years of working on the stage and making pieces for the stage and also growing up as a dancer and a performer, um, I wanted to find ever more ways to bring the experience closer and closer to the body of the visitor. I wanted the body of the visitor to also be activated, which is not to say that they're not activated when you're sitting in, in a theater, uh, in, a, in a traditional theater setup, but um, I felt that those rituals of the theater relied mostly on the eyes and on the vision to be the primary mode of receiving the piece. And I think it was always my fascination to try to bring uh, composition to the other senses, so sound, smell, taste, um, as a way of bringing an awareness to the visitor about their own body, their own situatedness, and their own experience inside of a situation. Um, and I guess that has a lot to do with how I feel about art, what art can do, and I think there's something about empathy, um, creating empathy, training empathy, practicing it, exercising it, that I think working with the senses uh, brings about. Let's talk about that a little bit, what art can do. Do you think that art should always be comfortable or do you think that we should be sort of pushing people and, and challenging the audience? Yeah, I think it depends on uh, which kind of strategies you're interested in working with as an artist. I think all of these strategies can be interesting and compelling. Um, I think to confront and to um, kind of aggravate or provoke uh, can also be an interesting strategy. But for me, in my way of approaching art, I have the feeling that um, situations of relaxation, situations of pleasure can potentially make us more open and more receptive to actually learning and to actual exchange. And why did the theme of this year's biennial appeal to you? Um, yes, there was a lot of talk, of course, in the last years about this idea of an echo chamber, of the way that our social media works and the way that we relate to one another. Um, which leaves conversations kind of, you know, echoing around the, the chamber, so thus leaving the echo chamber. Um, I think for me, um, remaining receptive, remaining open and available to new experiences is really key. Um, and I think that the work that I created um, was really trying to make a connection to a place I'd never been, to a culture I don't know about, um, to people that I'd never met. So there were many ways in which um, my approach to creating this piece in Sharjah for the Sharjah Biennial had a lot to do with finding ways of crafting uh, uh, an ethical relation to something that one doesn't know. So the relation to the other, which of course this is one of the, the big things that's kind of critical in our world right now, um, like who's in, who's out, who's considered the, the, the citizen of the moment and who's the outsider, who's the other. Um, and I think how we then form our relationships to the, that that we don't know, the things that are beyond our comfort zone or beyond our level of understanding, these ways of forming the relationship are very important. And I think that this is what my work tries to really focus on is how to become more receptive as an individual and which kinds of practices might help us to do that. And tell us a bit about your piece titled Untitled Inwardness Juice Natures. So in the work, I'm responding to the specific topographical location where the piece happened, which is this abandoned ice factory in the middle of the desert. Uh, to its left was a nature reserve, a mangrove forest that was being protected. Um, and on the other side of it was an eco-luxury resort. And for me, I found this kind of triangle of relations very interesting, bringing up questions of what is the appropriate way for humans to relate to nature. Um, is it as the kind of industrial exploiter of natural resources? 
is it as the savior uh, idea of where you kind of banish people and try to regenerate uh, the land? Um, or is there something to be said for this kind of new industry of ecotourism? Um, and what are the, the ways that we can question and look at our, our own personal relations to nature and how can we, with others and with our communities, find um, potentially healthier ways of relating to it in the future? So the piece is really reflecting in a poetic way around these themes. When you lose a loved one, it's customary to personalize their graves, whether you plant flowers or adorn the site with ornaments. What is definitely unusual is putting a grave site on public display. Showcases Nasena Tuta stepped into the murky vault of a new exhibition here in Istanbul to see replicas of historical gravestones. From the dim ambience, to the constant dripping of water from the ceiling, and the puddles of water that surround the artwork. Everything about this exhibition is unusual, to say the least. The building was built by the Romans during the 5th century. Like many of the cisterns in the neighbourhood, Sherefia cistern was also made to provide water to Istanbul. Centuries later, it now houses exhibitions. At first glance, you can't really tell where the artwork is. But located in the watery grounds of the Sherefi Assistin is Aysun Sandukcoğlu's exhibition called Purgatory. The Turkish sculptor reimagined ancient gravestones from the Seljuk and Ottoman empires. Back then, a gravestone could tell a lot about the deceased their marital status and ethnicity, if they had any children or not, or if perhaps they were soldiers who died in action. The entire point of this exhibition is to remember people's lives and pay respect to their century-old stories. The artist says she dedicates the exhibition to her two grandmothers, both deceased and eternally missed by their family, but immortalized in her artwork. In 1735, during the Ottoman Empire, a woman died in labor and she was buried with her child. The gravestone maker depicted her and her baby on the gravestone. This is the only example of its kind that I came across and it deeply affected me because my grandmother died in 1945 while she was delivering her eighth baby and their loss has ever since been a big pain for the family. Before everything else, I wanted to commemorate my grandmother. Then I wanted to send my respects to the original gravestones by mixing contemporary designs with their stories. The exhibition is Sandık Çoğlu's tribute to history and the family bond, which is manifested through her sculptures. As a Turkish artist, I've always preferred telling the stories of my own culture and people. The subject matters I usually delve into are the civilizations that came and passed these lands. The reason why I do this is that I see it as my duty to history and my upbringing. And when my art is about my own identity, I see that the audience also likes the works more. Because when it's your story, the artwork has a stronger foundation and it becomes clearer for the audience to see, so they appreciate it more. The system already attracts history lovers all around the world. But if you want to step into another realm altogether, the Purgatory exhibit showcases these sculptures until the end of April. Nur Sanat Ter, TRT World, Istanbul. That's it on this episode of Showcase. Don't forget you can head to our YouTube channel for more from the world of culture and the arts. But before we leave, we'd like to take you to Japan. With winter in its last days and spring just around the corner, there are still some people who can't wait for the flowers to blossom. And now, a show in Tokyo is letting people stop and smell the cherry blossoms in the most high-tech of ways. I'm Murray Beveridge. Thanks for joining us. See you next time.